Thank you very much. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I'd love to introduce you to Sidewalk Labs and what we're doing to make cities more inclusive and sustainable. I think we can all agree that climate change is the existential threat facing our world today. Well, maybe we can't all agree on that. I know the President of the United States does not believe that, but pretty much everyone else does. What is important to recognize is that cities, in many ways, are the problem. If you look here, you can see that a significant majority of carbon emissions come from cities, and that percentage is actually growing more quick, quickly. At the same time, though, cities are also the answer. This is a comparison of the carbon emissions per person generated in the United States on the left compared to New York City on the right. There are nearly less than one-third as many carbon emissions per person out of a dense city like New York. And this is true all over the world, that as cities get denser, they become more carbon efficient. It's been a good thing that over the last 25 or 30 years, cities, particularly the largest cities, have actually been growing. But we can't assume that that is going to happen forever. In Europe, too, our largest cities have been growing. That's the good news. The bad news is that the good times may be coming to an end. It's very important that cities actually grow. My background is I was the deputy mayor for economic development under Mike Bloomberg in the period right after 9-11. We govern New York City on a theory the theory of what we call the virtuous cycle of the successful city. The city's objective is to grow because when a city grows, it has more money to reinvest back in improving the quality of life, which simply attract more people, perpetuating the cycle. That's the virtuous cycle of a successful city. That's what you want to achieve. That model is under threat. It's under threat in New York, and it is under threat under virtually all large cities in the entire world. What happened with Amazon? Why did Amazon, ultimately sort of the best example of the virtuous cycle in action, get defeated when a significant percentage of New Yorkers were actually in favor of Amazon coming to New York? It failed basically because of three things. One, a sense that corporate power was gaining, getting too great. Second, it failed because people were concerned that it was going to make the issue of housing affordability worse. And third, it looked like it was a secret deal between government and a company. New York lost out on the opportunity to generate 25,000 new jobs and $4 billion in tax revenues. This is starting to happen everywhere, and it is going to kill the potential for growth and to get more people into cities where we can deal with climate change best. In fact, all over the world now, the term developer 
has become what we call a dirty word. Something that you're almost embarrassed to be. People who build things in cities are being targeted for hatred in many cases. And it's all over the same set of issues. Housing affordability, sustainability, economic opportunity, giving of benefits in return for getting properties able to be developed, giving people the ability to participate in a process and increasingly digital governance. Now, I want you to understand, I think the concerns that are driving decisions like Amazon, the underlying concerns, are not wrong. Look at this chart. This is in the United States, but it's happening in Europe too. Over the course of the last 60 years, housing prices have skyrocketed, particularly in comparison to the average income of Americans. That gap is creating extraordinary political and social pressure. And that pressure is now being manifested in terms of projects getting killed, delayed, or made more expensive, which is going to make city growth more difficult. In the United States, that growth model that I talked about is already starting to slow. And as somebody who used to be really responsible for igniting the virtuous cycle of growth in New York, the scariest thing is this green line. Growth in New York City actually went negative in 2017, but it's not just New York. It is most major cities in North America and inevitably, it is going to happen in Europe as well. What we risk, what we risk is the virtuous cycle going into reverse, where instead of having more revenue, we have less revenue, which leads to less investment in quality of life, which leads to people leaving our cities our carbon efficient cities and the vicious cycle perpetuating itself. Because we've lived in a golden age of cities over the last 30 or more years, we forget that it doesn't always have to be this way. In New York City in the 1970s, New York City in one decade lost 800,000 people, 10% of its population, two times the population of Tel Aviv in one decade. We can't afford to let that happen. The good news is, is we think we can make it stop. We think we can halt this potential vicious cycle and instead by focusing on innovating in our urban environments, we can reignite the virtuous cycle. And it couldn't be happening at a more important time. For all of you, I'm sure this will be of no surprise, but we right now are just entering the fourth urban technology revolution. The first one was in the early 1800s with the steam engine, which brought goods and people to cities. The second was in the late 1800s with the electric grid, which made cities vertical, made them 24 hours, made them easier to get around in, made them cleaner. The third was the automotive revolution, which forced us to confront these dangerous vehicles on our streets and create parking and new industries around them, made cities easier to get in, uh, into and out of. But now we're on the cusp of the fourth ur urban technology revolution, 
and that is the digital revolution. Everyone here is familiar with the fundamental technologies that actually are driving this fourth urban technology revolution. Connectivity, sensors, computing power, machine intelligence and artificial intelligence and design and construction technologies all built upon the internet. We know there's a smart city movement on some level, we're all a part of it, but I think we have to acknowledge compared to expectations, the smart city movement thus far has been a major disappointment. And in part, it's been a major disappointment because it is extraordinarily fragmented. But that's not the way cities function. Cities are a set of interconnected urban systems that require a holistic approach in order to address their most serious issues. And that is why Sidewalk Labs was formed. As our mission statement says, we seek to combine forward-thinking urban design and cutting edge technology to radically improve urban life. This last part is what's most important. It's never about the technology. It's about the result. It's about making people's lives better. When we improve the human condition in cities, our cities get better. It's all about the impact. As you heard, we are a subsidiary of Alphabet. We're the much smaller sister company of Google. But what we have by being part of the Alphabet family is access to one of the world's most innovative companies, and this whole sandbox of technology, ranging from self-driving vehicles to the leader in artificial intelligence to expertise and connectivity and way beyond, in order to begin to think holistically about the future of cities. In order to overcome what we call the urbanist technologist divide, we know that in cities, and we think about innovation in cities, there are two kinds of people. One are the urbanists, the people who think about cities, plan cities, build cities, run cities. And then there's the technologists, the ones who develop the ideas that hopefully will be brought into the urban environment. I'm guessing every single person here understands that those two kinds of people don't speak the same language. They have different time frames, different risk profiles. They don't understand each other. We've built Sidewalk Labs by bringing together a team across a whole set of disciplines right from the very beginning where it's been critical that they have to understand each other. We are a mission-driven company, but we also need to make money. We are not in this just to do good. And we do it three ways. One is from real estate development, where we'll act as a developer or a co-developer and earn fees and profits for the innovation services we provide. We also have created a company to do infrastructure finance, and we invest in urban technology companies. And last, we incubate and develop companies of our own that can be deployed in the urban environment. Our flagship project is on this site right near downtown Toronto. For those of you who don't know Toronto, it's the fastest growing city in North America that is actually part of a much larger site 
This is about um, 340 hectares, roughly the size of Central Park in New York, capable of accommodating roughly 100,000 people and nearly as many workers. And for the last two years, we've been at work with the governments in Toronto to develop a plan to make this the most innovative district in the entire world. You can all read it. It is not translated into Hebrew. But you can all read it online at www.sidewalktoronto.ca. It's 1,524 pages. And while it's a plan for that specific site, it also is a guidebook to urban innovation in the 21st century. So here's the plan for Toronto. First thing you'd notice is that all of the buildings are made out of wood, mass timber. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. It's a beautiful waterfront site. But this is really the approach that we're taking. It is a comprehensive integrated approach. Now, I know you're not going to read this, but this is 60 different urban innovations that are all designed to work together to actually reduce the cost of living to produce a climate positive community, to make it safer on the streets, to create more opportunity through new approaches to social infrastructure. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Instead, I just want to touch on a couple of aspects. The first thing is, is that underlying everything is a new approach to digital infrastructure and digital governance. Our project, if you followed it, has been controversial because people were afraid that a company affiliated with Google was going to seek to scoop up everybody's data and somehow sell it. That is not our model. And it's taken us time to get people comfortable with our approach to actually the physical infrastructure planning so that we can have seamless connectivity and open access for everybody but at the same time, as importantly, to assure the public and government that they are going to be in charge and that privacy is actually not a problem. Critical to the entire approach is a completely novel way of dealing with data that is very transparent and creates a sense of accountability. Let me talk for one second about our buildings agenda. What do we want to do with respect to buildings? At the end of the day, what we want to do, if we believe in creating inclusive and sustainable communities, is we want to find ways to lower costs and do that through every part of the construction process, from planning to actual construction to occupancy, to even making the buildings easier to adapt over time. Let's start with master planning. Anybody who's ever done a plan for a big site knows how complicated it is, how many different variables are involved in every plan that is developed. Everything ranging from transit to water performance, to build costs, to light and air and greenhouse gas emissions. It's very hard to actually plan for all of those things at the same time. We've actually developed a tool. It'll be a product. We're now starting to use it with third parties that uses machine learning and computational design to be able to optimize among all of those different factors at the same time. Where you can literally look at thousands and thousands of different alternatives from a massing and planning perspective in order to find out what's optimal. This is a good example of how we actually used it in Toronto. Right here is the city's original plan 
for one of the neighborhoods on the waterfront. What they cared about was the total amount of square footage, how much daylight access and open space. This was their approved plan. We applied our tool and came up with hundreds of alternatives that gave more square footage that could be built, but at the same time produced significantly more open space and significantly more daylight access. Better planning means more money that can be turned back into greater affordability. From a construction perspective, anyone who has done construction is familiar with this chart on the left. Whereas productivity in white and the economy in general has continued to increase, they're here over the last 30 years in the construction industry it has gone down. The result is, is that our costs have gone up. Why is housing so expensive? In part because construction so expensive. Have we seen any real changes in the way we construct buildings in the last 100 years? No, not really. And so what we're proposing is a completely different approach. Buildings made out of mass timber done in a factory that is highly automated with a kit of parts that we have designed that can be produced mostly in the factory itself. Why do we care about that? Because at the end of the day, we think what can happen is we can build buildings much faster, a 30-story building, the frame of it can be built in the same time it takes to concrete to build a 12-story building. And we think we can ultimately achieve savings of 30 to 50%. OK, that's construction. Now, how about space? If you think about an apartment that was built maybe after World War II, and you think about an apartment today, pretty much the same, right? Family sitting in front of the TV on a couch, walls basically built the same way. We think we can change that. How do we do that? By thinking about space differently. We call that approach affordability by design. One of the aspects of that approach is to use robotic furniture. We and IKEA together invested in a company out of the MIT Media Lab called Ori that we believe at the end of the day, for example, can make a 500 square foot or a 50 square meter apartment feel like 65 square meters because the interior can actually be adaptable very easily. So when 500 square feet or 50 square meters feels like 65 square meters, where does that extra value go? In some cases, it can go to profitability for the developer. In some cases, it can be turned back into greater affordability. Let me just touch on one more aspect of the buildings, the walls. What happens when a family wants to expand in a multi-unit building because their family's growing bigger? Or maybe a senior wants to get a smaller apartment. Renovations are impossible. Why are renovations impossible? Because of the wires in the walls. They make it impossible to move the walls without significant construction expense. Our approach is different. It's to design a flexible wall system that are designed for change. And what makes that possible is a new technology called digital electricity. Electricity that is delivered over ethernet cables that are much safer and therefore the wires don't have to be put in the walls, but they can be hidden in the baseboards making it much easier to literally move the walls. Why do we care about that? 
because it makes leasing easier, makes renovations less expensive, and over time it decreases the cost of the building itself. Less cost means more affordability, means more people can actually live in that building. All of these things that we've just talked about with respect to our building agenda have a significant impact on carbon emissions. 85% of the things that I've shown you and other aspects of our building agenda, 85% less carbon emissions, 75% less construction waste, 85% fewer truck deliveries to assemble the building on the site. And that is only a part of a very integrated approach to sustainability for the entire project. By working on buildings themselves, on energy savings, on a mobility strategy, them all working together, we can literally get to what we call climate positive. Where out of this site, we will be exporting clean energy back to the grid. It's never been done at this scale in the world. So I want to just close with something where I know I'm preaching to the choir here. You all believe in the power of innovation. But it goes beyond business models or anything else. This is ultimately all about reigniting the in danger virtuous cycle, enabling our cities to become more dense, overcoming the growing political and social pressures so that we can address truly the greatest issue that we have in our time. Get more people into cities, deal with climate change. That's what we hope to do, and I know all of you are playing a role in that as well. Thank you very much.